Uh, welcome everybody. Today we're going to go through quite a lot of information, starting with the um, interim results presentation that, that was presented this morning, and then following on with a, a presentation from the Capital Markets Day. I'm joined today by Rogers Wong uh, and Harry Kiriakou. So we will go through the various parts of the businesses relatively quickly because we're trying to combine those two presentations together um, and, and get it all done within a reasonable time to allow enough time for questions at the end. So if I can start here on the H1 financial highlights. Um, as many of you have seen from the RNS, use, clearly it's been a, a very challenging environment. Um, and with some of our sort of key regulated markets in particular being heavily impacted by the various macroeconomic uh, impacts of inflation, cost of living, and obviously the, the situation over in Ukraine. However, during the course of the first half of the year, we have actually achieved quite a lot um, despite those headwinds. And we continue to work on securing a robust and, and strong business that will really give us a foundation for sustainable growth going forward. Just breaking down into the three parts of the slide here, starting with financials, this is an overview. During the first half, we saw an increase in revenue of 28.6%, and that primarily a result of the inclusion of our most recent acquisition, Billy. And we'll touch on that in more de detail a bit, bit later on in the presentation, but this fully offsets the softness in the organic sales which is primarily around the regulated market of kettles. EBITDA saw a slight decrease of 1.9% and PAT actually a 50%, driven mainly by interest and finance costs, which are attributed to that acquisition, along with weakness within that kettle market, particularly in Q1. A net debt increased to 93 million um, at the end of the first half of the year, representing a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 2.66, uh, which is well below the covenant, and we plan to get that down to 2.1 times by the year end with the current forecast. And as a board, you know, we continue to take precautions to balance the capital allocation priorities and have declared an interim dividend of 0.9 pence this morning. From a strategy point of view, uh, the acquisition of Billy has been extremely positive. Uh, and as you hear as we go through the CMD presentation, that acquisition will be quite transformational um, to the business going forward, providing double digit cage of growth and very, very strong ca uh, cash generation. We've also established a, a new divisional structure within the group to ensure we have the appropriate policies, the right procedures, the resources, and focus to make sure we are securing um, all of the strategic business objectives um, with the right focus from the right people in the organization. And that will give us a revenue in 2026 of 206 million um, and broken down later on between the various divisions. From an operational point of view, uh, integration of Billy has gone extremely well, thanks to the efforts of the team. Um, they have really um, committed to doing that as quickly as possible. And again, we'll touch on that a little bit later as we get into Capital Markets Day. But we've also managed to secure some additional sales channels for Billy in the short time that they've actually been under our ownership. From our operations and commercials um, point of view, again, team is performing very well. Uh, we have uh, launched a new filter production line for the anti filters over in Italy. Um, so we can actually supply filters in the West to the West, and obviously that will improve our margins going forward for those particular products. We've developed our own range of fridge jugs, which are produced in our new China factory, um, which have received a number of sustainability awards already. And we have um, a pipeline of new product launches, which include in particular the Aurora coffee and digital filter kettle with toaster set, just to name a few. If I can move on to the next slide, Hannah. Um, just looking at the market conditions, and I, a, a lot of questions around, you know, where, where have been the issues during the course of the first half of the year, of the year and really it centres around the regulated markets of kettles. Um, a lot of different um, things have happened. Obviously, we've got the situation with, with um, COVID, we've had the situation with Ukraine. All of those have had an impact in terms of the kettle demands. Uh, and typically, you know, we've always sort of seen a bullwhip effect come in where we've seen a very fast recovery. This particular downturn has been slightly different. As you can see from the, from the left-hand side of the screen, as you look at it at the moment, um, the regulated market has actually remained in negative growth versus prior year for the whole of the first half of the year. Um, however, as we reported in March, we are seeing improvement, and you can see from that, that sort of curve, if you like, that there is continual improvement. And in fact, in certain markets, particularly UK and Germany, um, that went positive during July. Uh, we haven't quite got the um, August numbers, but we'd expect them to remain positive in August as well. So definitely there is a trend of recovery, um, but it's much slower than the normal bullwhip that we would have expected. And that's the key reason why we've changed our forecast going out. 
Less regulated market actually is performing much better. You know, that turned to growth in July for the first time since Q3 of 2020 during COVID. But actually that's driven perhaps quite surprisingly by Russia, where you've seen very significant growth. Uh, unfortunately, that's a market that we can't particularly access. Uh, and most of the major brands have, have also taken or adopted that same strategy and are not dealing directly with the, the Russian brands. Overall, um, the regulated market is up 19%. In fact, Strix has seen very positive growth in the in the less regulated, sorry, uh, with a growth of around 33%. So despite not being in Russia, we certainly are still winning specifications, still gaining share in those markets. On the right hand of uh, the screen there, you can sort of see the historic trends of the market. Um, and you can see the market has been very resilient. It always rebounds back to that 5% CAGR. I say typically that can be anything from a two to four quarter depression. Yeah, this one has been very different. We've had COVID, we've had cost of living crisis, we've got the Ukraine situation as well. That clearly is making the recovery a lot slower, particularly in the regulated market. And our forecasts now are reflecting that slower growth rate um, over the course of the medium term. Just looking at a couple of the other markets, just to give a bit of color around that. USA actually has been very stubborn. That remains a negative growth, clearly a much lower penetration in the USA. So you're not getting any of that discretionary spend. Uh, and that's been negative throughout the, the, the year so far and still no signs of that improving And Japan in particular has shown very negative growth through the course of the first half of the year. I think that's been well publicized in the media. It's a relatively small part of the market for kettles overall, but still means that the overall performance of the regulated market is still showing a 12% decline during the first half of the year. I'm just talking about our OEMs, just again, to give you a little bit more background with that. What we're seeing typically is around an 80% shortfall in, in the um, projections of the regulated market. Our largest OEM today actually is running about 81% versus its peak numbers, which is about 22% above prior year. So again, positive, but pretty flat with 2021. So definitely, as I say, a recovery, but a slower recovery than we had, had hoped for. I'll let you switch slides now, Hannah. Thank you. Um, Billy is, is, is the next part of the, of the presentation. Now, Billy is, is um, very, very positive. And just to give a bit of a reminder, perhaps, of the strategic rationale around the acquisition, it has had a very successful history of double digit growth with excellent cash conversion, around 88%. It will materially change the earning profile of the group, um, adding well developed premium products with the potential to integrate some of our strict patents and technology as we go further to enhance performance and differentiation. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for upside, as we'll see in the capital markets day as we continue to integrate, um, particularly with things like procurement and insourcing, but also consolidation of the marketing. And at the moment, they're only really selling three main territories, which is Australia, New Zealand and the UK. So we're going to leverage on the footprint and infrastructure of Strix um, globally to find other areas where we can expand quite quickly, particularly into Europe and into Asia. The team themselves have made excellent progress since we acquired them back at the back end of November. Uh, which I think really does show the capability of the team. We're now out of all of the TSA agreements without any incidents. Um, we've actually set up and in fact expanded the head office in Wolverhampton. That was done within three weeks of, of taking over that business. We've opened a new showroom in Farringdon in London. So if anybody's coming over to London, feel free to please come and look at that. We'll be able to show you the products and, and really go through the differentiation versus our competitors. We put in new storage facilities across Australia, New Zealand and the UK. And we've signed up new distributors in places like the UAE and Qatar with many or two others actually this year pending uh, before the end of the year. We've even put in a new ERP system in the UK in just four months. So a lot of work has been done. All of that has been uh, very successful. I think just speaks to the, uh, the performance of the staff uh, within that group. Can we move to the next one, please. So just looking at our capital allocation, yeah, we continue as a group to focus on deleveraging the business despite that softening in the cattle market. And we expect to reduce the debt to EBITDA from 2.66 um, at the end of the half year to 2.1 by the year end, and a clear plan to get below 1.5 times in the medium term. Until that point, we're committing to hold off on any future M&A uh, and manage you know, our CapEx and costs internally accordingly to ensure that we are driving down that as quickly as possible. And given that current position on debt, the board continues to take precautions to really balance the capital allocation priorities. And to be prudent, the board has decided to prioritize the reduction of debt for the rest of the current year. 
On that basis, um, we have declared an interim dividend of 0.9 pence per share payable in December. And going forward, we have um, adapted the dividend policy to be a, um, based on a payout ratio of 30% of adjusted PAT, which will enable sustainable returns to our shareholders. And once we've reduced the debt below that 1.5 times, then we'll have the ability to be able to return any excess capital to shareholders as appropriate. Uh, now with that, what I'd like to do is to pass over to Rodres and start to look at some of the financials for that first half of the year. Right, thank you, Mark. So financial highlights, top line increased 26.8%, and that's purely due to the addition of Billy of 21.5 million. Um, Strict's organic top line decline circa 14%, and that's from the previous first half. And again, that was um, mainly due to the capital control sales um, softened. Uh, within the categories, cattle control organically declined 17% of around 6 million. Consumer goods that consists of aquatoma, like uh, of both water and appliances, it dropped 7% of around 1 million. Billy's performance has tracked very well and is in line with target for the first half, where we also expect it to stay on track for the full year. Uh, just the Gross profit margin delivered 22.6%, where the gross profit margin track at 36.7%, and that's largely due to the acquisition of Billy, uh, where it brought in 10 million in gross profit for the first half. It was partially offset by the Strix organic gross profit decline of 28%, which is around 5.6 million. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 24%, um, there was a minor reduction of 1.9% of 300K. And um, the addition of Billy helped to offset the shortfall in the cattle controls in the EBITDA. In terms of the operating costs, um, the whole Billy has added around 5 million costs on. Um, if we excluded the Billy within the strict organic um, distribution costs, um, we have seen that decline by 9%. Um, however, there is an increase in the AMP advertising and promotional cost in the consumer goods segment, especially in the digital channel, where um, it was a little bit more investment in that area in, in order to protect our shares. Administrative costs, however, uh, was managed well, where it kept low against inflation and um, it declined by 1%. Adjusted PAT declined 51%, and that was a shortfall of 5.9 million versus last year, first half. And that was mainly due to three reasons, um, where the finance interest finance cost was the majority of that, that accounted for the 3.7 million. Depreciation and amortization is an 800K increase, and the major majority of that came from Billy. Um, tax expense of 1.1 million increase, again, that is because of the Billy's group in the three um, locations, Australia, New Zealand, and UK. Net debt increase to 93 million from year end of 87, where we have seen operating in, in cash inflow of 16 million. And um, we have also seen outflows, however, of higher interest expense of 6.1 million. And there is a very last end um, batch of the Leica earnouts of 7.5 million, and that was all done in quarter one of this year. We can turn on to the next page. Then um, gross margin analysis here. Uh, we can see that um, we reported 36.7%, which is about 170 basis point decline versus the last period. Our organic gross profit margin was 32%, with Billy at 46%. The analysis here showed the relative weight of each of the categories' impact on the gross profit. And first of all, it's on cattle controls that we saw a 5.5% negative impact on the margin, where um, for the last, uh, for the first half, uh, we reported 37.2%. And that is um, a large part of that drop is because of the top line um, with um, slower than um, slower recovery in the regulated markets, where the uh, cattle controls in the regulated markets command the highest margins of all the categories. 
And uh, however, we have seen better recoveries in China and less regulated markets, but they were uh, they did give us a modest improvement on the margins. Um, we were helped by better commodity costs as well. That gave us about 1.5% improvement. Um, another factor that came into play was that um, due to our efforts to lower the production as um, softening of the top line. So the, uh, there was under absorption of fixed manufacturing overhead costs on a per unit basis as due to the lower production volume. But as production volume uh, resume normal, um, we should start to see the absorption rate go back up and that would normalize our cattle control margins. Billy itself tracked at a budget level, which is 46%, and we expect the 46% to prevail in the next half. Consumer goods contain, again, Aquatima and Leica brands in the water appliances where we have seen um, quite a bit of a challenge in the retail market. And in terms of the digital channels as well, where we were having um, some re uh, re -negoti renegotiation with Amazon. And therefore, we do need to incur and invest A&P costs to support some of the promotional deals. And um, if we can turn to the next slide. Net debt. Net debt is 80, was 87 million, um, that's um, increased to 97 million. And um, Billy, there was a cash, uh, there was an outflow of 1.7 million. But however, strict our organic networking capital inflow was 1.8 million. So therefore, the overall networking capital shows a bit of um, a flat in terms of the swing. Um, the financing costs have gone up and um, uh, half over half, it was 3.7 million increase. And um, in terms of exceptional costs um, that has uh, added to the net debt was about 2 million. And that's, that's largely due to the Billy post acquisition transaction cost. And there was also a small portion of restructuring cost that was executed in quarter two this year. In terms of the net debt um, EBITDA ratio, it reported at 2.66 at the first half. And in when we get into quarter three, the debt covenant ratio decreased to 2.25 times, which is going to be a bit of a bottleneck there. However, we are confident that there is there is a, we are going to be compliant. And when we get into quarter four, we expect that to reduce to 2.1 times where the covenant is, sits at 2.25 onwards. Um, quarter four is the highest um, season in terms of cash inflow and, and sales as well. So we are confident that we would not have any problem going forward. Um, there are quite a few measures that we have taken to maximize our liquidity and cash pool. And um, more effort and uh, more efforts of that will be going in, continue going into the second half of this year. Um, for one thing is that for sure, we are going to continue to um, tighten up CapEx uh, and in terms of reprofiling of CapEx, where uh, any CapEx that is not immediate revenue generating, we will reprofile that to a later stage. And for those CapEx that, are, that have a customer contract matching, um, we, will, we will negotiate where the um, customer payments will be matching to the CapEx investment. We are also reinstating the just-in-time procurement as the measures that we have adopted during the COVID times, where we will reduce the stock holding period and proactively promoting any age stocks, especially in the consumer goods group in uh, Leica and North Baltimore. And to balance the capital allocations, where we have also looked into a much reduced dividend, where it will help to preserve cash while balancing the investors' interests. Uh, by the end of this year, um, our term loan, which is amortizing quarterly, will reduce to 24.8 million from the original 39 million. It will be completely paid off by the end of FY25. So for technical guidance for the next page, that this is for the full year, um, adjusting items that we have introduced that would include the non-cash elements of the amortization of the acquired intangibles due to the acquisitions of Billy, that's around 900K. The exceptional cost, um, which is largely of the post uh, Billy acquisition, will be included in this bucket as well. And that is the maximum of 2.5 million for the full year. 
effective tax rate is 8.5 to 9.5. That is purely because of the uh, Billy group of, of roughly 25 to 30 percent corporate tax rate. CapEx and CapDiv projection of 10 million, that, in, uh, that is going to include the Billy investment of 2 million, where um, the Billy UK, Billy Australia, and so on, we need to invest in the CapEx to build up the new office, uh, the showroom, and new product launching. Um, we expect the CapEx and CapDiv rate to run at around 6% of net sales going into FY24. And then uh, interest and finance charges is uh, running at the uh, uh, current Sonia curve rate, and that's around 10 million for the full year. All right, and then uh, for now, I will pass it back to Mark to continue the business plan. Thank you, Mark Childress. Okay, so one of the other changes that we made into the business is to change the um, structure of the business, putting in a divisional structure. Uh, and the reason for doing that is to really make sure that we've got the right resources, the right processes and the right focus on the various parts of the business. Clearly, over the last sort of two or three years, the business has changed. We've got one part of the business, consumer goods, which is very much consumer face, whereas the other parts of the business, particularly the kettles and billy to a degree, are first of all manufactured over the, in the east, but they're also more of a business to business type of approach. And we need to have a different approach for those two different uh, divisions. So we have split those two parts of the business. We have what we call the SCB, which is Strict Controls and Billy. Um, that will actually um, have similar margins, a similar cash profiles for the two businesses. They both have very mature leading technologies. They have established brand names in the markets they're in, and they also have very good market share in those territories. Furthermore, yeah, Billy will be provide very significant, significant opportunities for growth through that sort of geographical expansion and through the new product development um, at very, very positive margins. The SCB division, sorry, the SCG division, the strict consumer goods led by Harry. This will cover all the consumer good brands, Aquatima, Leica, and Australia. And again, will allow significant growth opportunities through innovation and through sustainable solutions, coupled with further geographical uh, expansion. So if I can first just touch on the SCB on the next slide. So this really starts to combine the two together. Um, we already touched a lot on the cattle market in terms of some of the issues that we faced, but yeah, really this is sort of looking at the longer term. As stated, cattle market yeah, is the main impact of the softening during H1, with Billy more than offsetting the decline, um, driven by the regulated market that has experienced about a 12% decline year on year so far to date. Um, however, we do see that um, recovering, although at a slower rate, and looking at our forecast going out, we have taken quite a prudent view in terms of how that recovery will take place, certainly not expecting or planning in any bullwhip impact during the medium term. Clearly, if that does happen, that will be upside to the numbers that we're presenting here at the moment. As far as Billy is concerned, all very positive. Everything is on track, running at about 10% above year on year um, in both terms of, of profit and, and top line. Um, and we will cover that in a lot more detail as we get into the CMD slides. So with that, if I may, I'm going to pass over to Harry just to touch on the SCG division. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll start on the left-hand side of the, of the slide there. Um, I guess for uh, consumer goods, it, uh, the first half was a little bit of a tale of two cities or a game of two halves, whichever you prefer. Um, you can see there from our EMEA and our North America regions, uh, we were able to grow year on year. Even in a, a declining market, as Mark presented earlier, um, in, in the key markets that we're presenting, we were still able to grow the business, which means we're outperforming our, our competitors and, and continue to find areas to grow through new distribution and new markets. Uh, unfortunately, in the APAC region, uh, we have had a significant decline, and that was mainly driven by the, the joint venture lapsing that we had in China. Uh, that has meant, obviously, a, a significant decline year on year, and one that we need to address in the second half and into 2024 through a, a new distributor to support our Leica brand in that region. Um, you'll see with the graph in, in the middle, um, when we started this uh, consumer goods journey uh, in earnest in 2020 at the last Capital Markets Day, uh, we've had a significant step up in the first year, uh, predominantly through the acquisition of Leica and expanding our distribution. Uh, the last couple of years through the, the uh, more challenging markets and, and declining markets has been a uh, Difficult to grow, but we have been able to grow slightly or maintain the business, which again it means a, a, a fairly robust performance in, in a challenging market. Um, and obviously, we uh, we we believe we can uh, progress on that, which we'll discuss more in the capital market stay section of the presentation. Um, on the right hand side, just some of the achievements and initiatives. 
Um, the perfect pour jugs, uh, which we have uh, discussed and presented to you in the past, uh, have won, uh, have been highly commended in the Sustainable Products of the Year uh, 2023 awards by Housewares Magazine. That gives us a, um, a lot of confidence that we're doing the right thing, bringing the right products to the market, and of course, always with sustainability in, in mind. The Aurora, which uh, we spoke about a lot in the past, uh, continues to win awards, and this year was again highly commended in the Small Domestic Appliances uh, Best Smart Innovation Small Domestic Appliances uh, 2023 in the uh, IAR uh, Magazine Awards, which is the Independent Electrical Retailers Magazine. So again, really uh, um, proving that we're doing the right thing in terms of new products and bringing the right products to market. Um, the geographical expansion, which we will talk about a lot more in the in the next uh, part of the presentation, has always has also progressed very well, particularly in EMEA through the Aqua Optima brand, where we have uh, grown 46% year on year. So again, proving that that geographical expansion is one of the key drivers to our to our growth plans. And finally, in North America, uh, we launched the Aqua Optima brand uh, online with major retailers at the first half of the year. Some. Uh, uh, Major retailers there, such as Home Shopping Network, QVC, Walmart, Amazon, uh, and Macy's. Um, and then in the second half, we will start to work more on uh, in-store listings for the for the 2024 launch, which of course is the is the key growth driver for the future. Finally, uh, a little bit of an outlook on 2023. Uh, what's driving and will continue to drive the growth in the regions of Amer and North America are the major incremental contracts that we've secured, and and those contracts will deliver circa 30% of the projected growth uh, in those regions. The market uh, still, unfortunately, if you look at the uh, British, uh, I think it's British Home Enhancement Trade Association, better. Uh, I think they, uh, they forecast that the market will decline 1.4% in the UK, which is, which is similar to, to the rest of Europe. And therefore, uh, it is still challenging. However, that decline is significantly less than the decline we've seen in the first half and last year where it was close to double digit. So we do see that softening and we do see those green shoots, which gives us confidence for the second half of the year and more importantly, 2024. And finally, we've continued to launch new products into the market with the Leica water filter kettle and toaster sets, uh, the dual flow uh, in Europe, the air treatment range, vacuum appliances in the UK, uh, the Aquaptima brand and, and range of water filtration in China, and we've extended our perfect pour range into the North American markets. So still uh, driving new products into the markets to help drive and fuel our growth. Thank you. I'll hand back to Mark. So just to, just to close off the um, interim part of the presentation, and, and I apologize, I know we're, we're rushing through this quite quickly. We're trying to pull together sort of a two hour presentation into an hour to make sure we've got some time for questions at the end. Uh, but just to sort of summarise the end, so kettles are very much recovery is happening in the market, so that's positive. However, in the regulated market, which is our, our key profitable territories, it is much slower than we would normally see in a bullwhip impact. And therefore, we have actually changed our guidance to reflect that slower growth in the regulated market, You're driven by, primarily by the macroeconomics, particularly in the, the UK and German markets. When you look at the forecast for the full year, yeah, we have an adjusted profit after tax forecast for Q3, which is around 6.5 million. Clearly, we've got about a week and a half to go, so we, uh, we have good visibility and good confidence in where that number is going to go. That would mean on a full year guidance of 21 million, we would need to do circa 9 million PAT in the last quarter. Uh, last quarter is always our biggest quarter in, in the industry. It's very seasonal. And look at the last two years. Um, they've been higher than the 9 million in both years, more around 11, 11.2. And in both those years, you only had a fraction of the billy um, revenues and profits coming into the market, actually none in 2021. So very achievable um, profit targets. Uh, and we're very confident, therefore, of being able to put that, that forecast forward and achieving those results for the second half of the year. From an SBO point of view, we put out some new um, strategic objectives for the next three years, which show us growing the revenue from 107 million in 2022 to 206 million in 26, with a gross profit of 80 million. Obviously, we'll cover that in more detail uh, in the CMD, but that really does reflect the attractiveness of the growth markets of both Billy and particularly the consumer goods as well, and a recovery, a slow recovery in the kettle market itself. As I said, we are going to continue to manage our costs very carefully very strong focus on lean initiatives, management of capex spend, reductions in inventory, really to make sure we can maximize that cash generation over the medium term. 
And finally, for me, you know, for this part, the integration of Billy is really going to propel us into a new growth phase, further diversifying into new areas, whilst maintaining focus on the cattle market as that recovery continues in the regulated markets, using NPD and commercial initiatives to regain the margin back to a circa 40%, which is where it would normally be. So that um, ends, I think, this part of the, of the session, Hannah. Um, and if you're okay, we'll move into the capital markets section of the presentation. Okay, so a little bit more detail on those strategic business objectives um, that are going to be delivered in, in by the end of 2026. First of all, we have set out those objectives to make sure we can deliver revenue growth of 206 million, gross profit of 80 million for the full year. And as you can see, we've broken that down into the various parts of the business. If you go back to 2020, you, we had actually put out a goal to double the size of the business by 2025, which has been roughly 200 million and a gross profit of around 67 million. In fact, we will be achieving the profit and very close to the top line, albeit yeah, with the, the help of the acquisition of Billy in, in that, in that um, profile. Um, when you look at those various um, SBOs, kettles, we're looking at a slow recovery back to 88 million by 2026. And that really is driven by innovative new products, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail shortly. And looking at sort of the, the standard things that we have in that, that, that section, sustainability, safety and convenience. Uh, we're really looking to change the benchmark of the control industry with some of the innovations that we've got, um, which we're very confident we will be able to achieve. From Billy, yeah, really leveraging on a new product that is already in place. We've just launched new products in Australia last month and expanding that geographical distribution in both residential and commercial to get to a 58 million of revenue and a GP in excess of 45% by 2026. Bearing in mind today, it's only in UK, Australia, and New Zealand in any size. So a lot of um, geographical growth opportunities. Consumer goods, we're looking to continue to grow the consumer goods beyond the market growth, again, through innovation, through world-class sourcing and commercial initiatives, uh, delivering 60 million with a gross profit in excess of 30%. And obviously a big part of that is the geographic expansion. Today we have very strong position in kettles globally, but the rest of the businesses, whether it be Billy or consumer goods, are strong in certain territories like the UK, Italy, Australia, New Zealand, but they're not global. So again, some significant opportunities to expand. And of course we can't do that without having the right people in the right place with the right skills. So certainly a lot of focus being put to make sure we can grow our employees, you know, continue to give them challenge, so they can actually grow their own careers and realize their own full potential as well as that of the business. And then finally, technology. This is a technology-led business. Uh, we do have some very innovative technology, and we'll cover that a little bit more in the detail of the Capital Markets Day as we go through. So if I may, I'm just gonna pass over to Rogers just to give a high level um, view of the financials um, for the next three years. Great, thank you, Mark. So revenue growth for the company, we're projecting that to surpass 200 million when we reach 2026. Um, in terms of the three business units uh, or the two divisions, cattle controls at present is the largest, where in terms of sales mix, it comprise take up 50% of the total portfolio. Um, we project that um, our reliance on cattle controls can reduce to 40% in three years where consumer goods and billy will, will grow faster than cattle controls and it will grow to 30% each when we reach 2026. Um, revenue CAGA for each of the business units varies where cattle controls growth will align more to the market growth while continue to be supported by the commercial initiatives and new product development where we project that to be a CAGA of 5%. Consumer goods has the smaller space for now, but however, it has a lot of potential to expand geographically, along with innovative, innovative product roadmap, where we're projecting that, that to grow with a CAGA of 16%. Billy, historically, has been in double-digit growth. It's very solid business, and we have uh, very confident that um, that uh, CAGA of 10% growth is sustainable going into the three years. And so the blended rate for the three years projection of all the, of all the two divisions or so the three uh, business units is, is a combined blended rate of, 10, rate of 10%. And that is, of course, uh, will be well supported by the strategic business plans where Mark and Harry will continue to elaborate later on in slides. In terms of the growth, profit growth, and we can uh, reproject that to go into a 10% CAGA as well into three years out. 
and the gross profit margins for each business unit, we expect that to maintain fairly at the same, uh, quite constant at the same rate. Cattle controls has been fairly constant in a normalized situation, and that's about 40%. I think uh, that is very well achievable. Billy at 45% is all the, all the time has been very um, fairly consistent anyway. And then consumer goods, uh, we expect that to improve back to a higher rate of 30% from the current 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 year as um, with um, the economy, the macro factor normalized along with the um, commercial initiatives, we are confident that can go back more to a normal rate of 30%. So um, again, with the um, a new management structure in place with a much more focused strategy by each of the management uh, structure within a division, we are quite confident that they are sustainable margins. So you know, now just moving into the, um, the cattle control. So moving first of all into the SCB division, um, starting with sort of projections for kettles. So you can see here, we've actually got the, the growth targets for 88 million. And this is probably the one area where we have revised our targets and been far more prudent in, in maybe the forward outlook. So you can see on the right hand side there, the market recovery in terms of CAGA growth, it's just 1.2%. Historically, the market has always grown between two and 3% CAGA on the, the value line. So even with the, the current forecast being sort of 80% of the, the normal peaks for a regulated market, we're taking a prudent view that this is gonna be a very slow recovery below the normal market growth. Clearly, if it recovers quicker, that's gonna be upside to the forecast that we've got here in place. Um, in terms of GP, yeah, we're looking at uh, um, 35 million by the end of 2026. There's a number of areas there. First of all, the value share that we have gives us um, a very big advantage over our competitors. If an OEM is going to tool a product and they go with a strict control, they can get access to 56% share of the value market. Um, so yeah, we will always be a, a preferred supplier to those OEMs that are investing in that sort of type of tooling. We also supply services across the whole of the value chain, everything from industrial design to the kettles, through to root cause analysis when there's problem, to actually working between the OEMs and the brands and retailers to link them together. In many cases, we actually sell the OEMs kettles to the brands and retailers, they're forming that link and becoming an integral part of the sales channel. So a very unique position within that value chain, one that I've not seen in another industry sector. From an NPD point of view, we have some really exciting new products that have come through, come through which as I say, will set a new benchmark uh, we do have a slide of that a little bit later on in the, in the pack, so I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. Um, and we're also looking, using that, that technology to move into adjacent markets, things like milk frothers, travel kettles, um, cordless irons, blenders, and so on. Uh, the change in controls will give us much more, um, much more flexibility to go into those types of applications going forward. If I look at the cattle market overall, still only a 45% only a household penetration, so still plenty of growth. Nothing has changed in the structure of the market at all. It really is just linked to that slower recovery of the regulated market. And we still maintain our 56% value share, excluding that area around the Russia-Ukraine um, issues at the moment. Can we move on to the next slide? Um, so this is again, just having a slightly different look uh, and maybe a more up-to-date look at some of the um, dynamics in the market, starting with the regulated market. Uh, we've talked a lot about the, the slower recovery, but actually, you know, despite being down 12% in H1, we have seen some improvements year to date in August, and we started seeing some positive trajectory, particularly in the UK and Germany. If I look at our top 10 OEM customers on the export side, you know, they're running at about 80% off peak in terms of their production lines. And that seems to be a message that's coming from many of the uh, industrial companies within the UK, that we're, ne we're not at the peak values, but we're certainly running at an improved level of circa 80%, and that is reflected in our forecast going forward. We're seeing a much stronger position with what we would call the A brands, yeah, there's large international brands who are showing a 36% improvement year on year. Again, that is showing a little bit more confidence in the regulated market that they're prepared to invest in stock, but overall still seeing a, a year on year decline in the total for that, that regulated market. Less regulated, definitely showing a stronger recovery. Yeah, we are seeing for strict of 33% growth in a market that's growing at around 10%. So again, certainly not losing share and looking like we're growing share, particularly given we are not in that area around the sort of the Russian part, which is actually the fastest growing market um, within that less regulated segment. And then finally, China, there's a lot of um, um, information in the media about China. Actually with kettles, China is performing quite well. 
Uh, we are up 13% on prior year, but flat if against the three year average at the moment. The market itself is showing a recovery since Q4 of 2022. And our real target now is to go after the electronic um, segment of that market. Um, today, we are not competitive in that market. The new product developers we're looking at will allow us to be able to be very competitive in there and really target what they call the healthy eating appliances. These are effectively electronic kettles that can work at different temperatures and they can be used for doing all sorts of things from herbal teas to soups to, to noodles, all sorts of different types of food products. Um, and that is the, actually the largest growing market in the, the China segment today. So we move on to the next slide. So this is um, just looking at new product development, and this is really all about new control. So we are looking to bring in a, a, a Series Z control that will actually launch in 2024, setting a new standard and a new benchmark in the kettle controls, really trying to move the goalposts um, with, innovation, with innovative technology. Um, these controls are physically smaller. Um, they're about 56% lighter, 18% lower in cost. Um, they are very, very difficult to make because of the physical size. And the only way you can manufacture those is with some quite sophisticated automation, something we've been working on over the last decade. If we tried to make them manually, it would cost about three times more than our existing controls. So yeah, really this is changing the goalposts for um, some of those um, competitors. Also, it does open up some other features. We're looking at some um, eco features uh, in there. So for instance, you're gonna start seeing, as you can see on the left-hand side, the bottom left-hand side, kettles where you can actually see the temperature on the side of the body. These will actually show that the kettle switches off when you get to 92 degrees and the, the inertia within the heating elements will actually continue to go to boil. It doesn't seem a, a big difference, but saves a significant amount of energy um, in that boiling process. So from a sustain, sustainability point of view, um, very, very important. Also, when we look at this new control, it allows you to have smaller elements. It allows you to have a smaller footprint in the kettle. So the OEM themselves are starting to get benefits from that smaller design, which obviously will encourage the OEMs to work more closely with Strix um, rather than using some of the, the competitors' products. So if I can move on to the next slide. So we're just going to jump into to the Billy side of, of, of this division. You know, as I said, from my perspective, a truly transformational acquisition for the business. You know, 40 or 46 percent margins, 88 percent cash conversion, history of double digit growth and on track to deliver you know, our 2023 budgets, despite all the various headwinds and despite all of the uh, distraction of extracting it from the previous company. So very, very strong performance. We're looking to grow this business to 58 million revenue by 2026, which I believe is quite a, a conservative view with a gross profit of 26 million. We have a very, very strong team in place, uh, and we basically will be looking to expand into different markets to, to deliver that growth. And if I can go into the next slide, we'll touch on some of those areas that we're going to uh, use for that expansion. So when you look at Billy, um, quite strong in the commercial side of, of the, of the, of the um, markets. Um, that's certainly their, their, their key place for Australia, New Zealand, and in the UK, offices like the ones we're sat in today. Um, it is a premium product without any doubt at all. Um, and you know, we will continue to drive that. We have seen some very, very strong growth during the course of 2023. And we've actually won two major contracts in the first half of this year, based on the showman that we put in place that are the two largest contracts in the history of Billy UK. So already starting to see some very, very positive wins in that segment. On the residential side, that's not been their, their focus. And the reason for that is they did not have the right product. On a Billy system, typically you need two taps, one to give you your boiling and chilled and one to give you your normal sort of um, water outlets. And in your home, most people don't want to have two, two sort of taps on the sink, two pieces of hardware. Um, last month in, in Australia, we launched a single tap. It will give you everything from boiled to sparkling to chilled, filtered, um, as well as your ordinary mains water as well, all through one tap device. Um, we've now installed that in one of the top 50 companies in Australia. Um, 37 units were installed there last month, and they've now asked to replace 10 other units in that site as well. Um, so very, very well received, and that product will come over to the UK in 2024 really allowing us to go after that residential market, an area where we don't have any real um, traction today. So that will be a very significant growth opportunity going forward. From a product point of view, yeah, this is a unique product. It is a premium product in the uh, multi-tap systems. 
It is effectively a water-cooled unit. It's a little bit like having a mini fridge under your sink. Um, unlike all of the other systems, you don't have to cut lots of holes in your, in your cabinets to get the air ventilation. This is all self-contained, uh, very simple to plumb in, very tidy underneath and physically smaller than pretty much all of the other units on the market, certainly the industrial units on the market. And then finally, you know, for this business, it's all about service, making sure that we can provide the right service to our customers in a timely manner. Um, and we put a lot of effort into this. You, you, you will see some of the results from, from um, the work that's been done so far in, 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 in Billy. So for instance, in the UK, the Trust Pilot has actually improved by 209%. We are now at a 4.7 score out of five for our service. Major contracts uh, are actually getting a two hour response time from Billy. Um, actually in all of the territories that we sell. That is absolutely key to the success of this business. And we literally run you know, um, customer service centers where we're monitoring on a, on a daily basis, call times, waiting lists, all of those things, uh, making sure we are constantly challenging ourselves to improve the service to our customers, as well as training third party service agents to make sure they can provide a similar level of service to our own um, technicians as well. So I can move on to the next slide, Hannah. This just um, shows you some of the um, NPD that's going on. First one on the left-hand side, effectively, is that new design. It's already won the Good Design Award over in Australia. Um, basically, it will give you five different types of water outlets in one tap. Um, it's contactless, or you can have a version with levers as well. Um, so really giving the, the user a lot of flexibility. That award was won uh, in September um, over in Australia and has been really well received. Second one you can see there is actually the contactless taps. Unfortunately, during COVID, Billy really didn't have uh, a solution for contactless, and they did lose some share during that period of time. Now they've got a very comprehensive range of contactless. Um, so yeah, whether it's for disabled people, whether it's for um, health reasons, uh, safety reasons, we can now offer a full range of, of hardware um, for those products as well. Um, the third one you can see there is effectively the new system. So it's an all combined system giving you uh, your, your um, hot, cold, chilled, all in one box, as I say, a sealed unit effectively, so very, very simple. One for residential use, one for commercial use. Uh, in the UK, they will be both launched in Q4, sorry, in Q1 of next year. And then finally, we have um, some uh, products that will just allow additional security of the water to make sure we're taking out um, any um, bacteria, viruses around in the water. This can be put in line with our systems something else that we are now selling as an addition to, to the Billy systems in the marketplace. Moving on to the next slide, really is sort of just looking at the, the roadmap of products. Yeah, a lot of work going on. And one of the things you'll, you'll see with Billy is, is under previous ownership, they really didn't have the focus on the, net, the new product development. With Strix, you know, we have a very strong engineering team over in China. We certainly have, the, have very strong technologies. We're looking to take some of that Strix technology into some of those Billy appliances as well. Clearly, we're going to expand in the residential side, putting more systems in place. We're going to continue to focus on ESG, having things like the refillable um, car cartridges for the sparkling water. And we're also looking at different ways of doing the filtration to add things like different additives, changing the alkal alkaline content of the water, but also changing the recyclability of some of those, those um, uh, cylinders as well. So a lot of things going on in that path, but yeah, certainly um, a very good roadmap of new products for the next three three year period. If we can move to the next slide, I think we move into consumer goods, so I'll pass over to Harry to cover that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 2023 remains a, a challenging year, but we see those green shoots of growth through new distribution, both in existing markets and new. Unfortunately, we have had some challenges within our APAC region, which has tempered this. Uh, but we're still looking to grow the business and still looking to move that business forward. As uh, Roger presented earlier, the 2026 plan for consumer goods is to grow the business to 60 million, uh, which is a, a, a high uh, teens uh, growth uh, CAGA uh, get across uh, those three years. And also from a profitability point of view, we're really looking to uh, expand our, our growth and our profitability to around that 30% uh, gross profit. And that really gives us a, a stronger growth on the profit uh, to, to deliver that profitable growth. Um, as per our last uh, Capital Markets Day, we split the uh, growth into three areas, market growth, commercial initiatives, and new product development. Firstly, with the market, uh, last year in this has seen a decline in the consumer goods markets at double digit level. Um, that is softening in the second half, as Mark has uh, showed in his, his slides uh, for the Keto Controls. 
Um, we are still uh, to see this big bounce back, um, but we do expect that to come uh, hopefully uh, later within 2024 and beyond. Um, projections moving forward, uh, which I'll go into more detail on the, the market, uh, the next slide for, for market uh, dynamics, is more conservative with a growth uh, of around 2.7% annual uh, revenue CADA on uh, the market. Um, to put this in, to put this into perspective, at the last capital markets day, the experts' predictions were thirteen percent annual growth for the categories we are present in. Uh, this was on the back of the strong consumer expenditure at the beginning of the COVID lockdowns, where a lot of people were at home, uh, investing in SDA, investing in kitchen appliances, investing in those products to make their home life better, um, and having the disposable income to do it as they were not going on holidays and, and such like. So. Um, the predictions at the time were that the markets will grow uh, double digit over 10%, um, which was what was fueling our, our plan at the time. Now, after the last couple of years of, of uh, decline, uh, those, those predictions have been tempered. And the expectation is that it's going to be growing, but uh, at a more conservative 2.7%. Um, within the commercial initiatives, the, uh, the most important thing for us there is to really grow that significantly, but through new contracts and geographical ex expansion. And I'll speak a little bit more about that on the next slides. And finally, as, as per KJC uh, Kettle Controls, uh, new product development is really critical for the consumer goods area. And our primary focus is on category leadership. So where we are bringing innovative products to the market, bringing new products to the market that are not uh, mass available, we really want to be the category leader in that space. And coupled with that, uh, we will continue our consumer goods manufacturing. 100% uh, of all our water filters are now manufactured in our own factories in China and uh, Vicenza in Italy. Uh, and we're also, as Mark uh, mentioned earlier, uh, have launched a new range of uh, kettle jug, uh, water jugs, excuse me, uh, from our China factory under the Perfect Pour design uh, family. So again, really looking to use our manufacturing skills uh, to drive that category leadership. If I can move to the next slide, uh, market dynamics. As that first point says, uh, there are changing purchasing habits and disposable income challenges uh, mean less consumer loyalty. Um, in a time of cost of living crisis, as we are at the moment, the consumer tends to trade down. And so therefore, private label tends to rise and also challenger brands uh, tend to grow. Um, and the market leaders tend to, to suffer a little bit more. Our brands are well positioned to take that market share versus the market leader in water filtration because we are the challenger brand. And also we have uh, we hold very uh, significant contracts within the private label water filtration market. Both those things really give us the confidence that we can uh, combat the, uh, the market conditions and continue to grow. Despite the cost of living crisis, sustainability still remains a key concern for, for consumers. Um, and again, we as Strix believe we have the products uh, and we'll speak a little bit more about products in the next slides to really address those sustainability problems. If we look at the water area, um, the predictions are that the market will continue to grow 10% across uh, the next few years. Uh, we steady 5% CAGR in the core pitches and filter segment, so jugs and filter segment that, that Strix is present in. Actually, um, although the, the, the pitches and filters segment is growing 5%, a lot of the growth that's driving the 10% for the total water category is driven by multifunction taps, where, of course, we are now present with Billy. So as Strix, again, well-placed to take advantage of the, of the market trends. Um, there are strong opportunities for growth within the faucet mounts, so uh, tap mounts, and, and again, uh, we'll talk to you about the, the product range that we have there. And within Europe, uh, Italy is, is the market that's expected to grow the fastest at 8.5% CAGR. And with our Leica brand, we are, again, very well positioned to take advantage of that. When we move to the appliances, um, if you take uh, Europe, UK and APAC regions, the prediction for small domestic appliances is to, is to grow around 4% over the, the coming years. Um, with the USA uh, more than double, predicted more than double growth of 8.9% through that, that same period. What you will notice that when you look at our previous slide where I talked about 2.7% growth, CAGR growth for the market, and here you see between four and nine and also five on the water, why is it different? The reason is the mix uh, and also that as Strix, we don't play in every category. So for example, uh, air, air fryers has been one of the largest and fastest growing areas in small domestic appliances, and we as Strix are not in that category, which is why those numbers are, are different 
and the 2.7 is really relating to the, the markets and the segments that we are presenting as strict. If I can move to the next slide. We'll talk about geographic expansion. You'll see the, the three short videos playing while I speak. These three uh, videos are really showing you our geographic and global manufacturing footprint. The first one there you'll see is uh, our Leica plant in Italy. The second one will be our Strix, our new factory in uh, China, Strix China. And then finally, uh, Billy in Australia. And this really shows you that we have a global footprint for manufacturing, which really enables us to, uh, to uh, serve our customers in every market and wherever they're present, um, both uh, locally and, and globally. Um, in terms of why, why are we confident about our geographical expansion over the coming years and why we, we're confident that will drive the growth, um, in EMEA, we've achieved the uh, ad quantum of branded distribution in two major retailers in the UK, Tesco's and Asda. Previously, uh, we were only present in private label in that, that grocery market. And now with, uh, with our ad quantum of branded products, we're now present in those, those retailers, which is a very strong progression for us. Um, distribution plan is in place uh, to expand across many key markets, such as Germany, France, Spain, Turkey, Nordics, and South Africa. Um, there we're already in, in, in uh, uh, strong negotiations and discussions with distributors that are keen to take on our brands and help us expand in those markets, which again gives us that confidence for growth in the coming years. Uh, we will continue to expand the Leica product range and brand into the UK. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the aquatum and geographical expansion is really gaining momentum with sales in Europe up 46% year on year, um, which again, fuels that confidence that we have for the growth. If I look at the APAC region, uh, we've appointed a new distributor in China for the Aquoptima brand. Um, as always in a new market, there will be a, small, a slow ramp up, but we're really confident that over the next three years uh, in one of the largest markets in the world, we will really able to gain some traction there. Uh, we've got new sales agreements with third parties in many markets in the region, some Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. I, I won't read them all, you can read them yourselves. And also we've defined a really detailed three-year strategic plan for the APAC region, delivering uh, two and a half times growth over that period. Again, such a key region for us, and uh, we really have, a, in our opinion, a robust plan to help us uh, maximize that growth. Finally, the Americas. Uh, in March this year, we launched the Aquatima brand at the International Houseware Show in Chicago. Uh, the reaction from the, the, the trade was, was uh, phenomenal. We got over 40 uh, leads from that, um, that show, and we've continued to work uh, with those leads to, to grow our business within the region. Um, in order to do that, though, we need distribution partners, and we have secured distribution partners in USA, Canada, and Mexico, so we really have strong coverage across the three key markets in that region, and that's enabling us to, to reach all of the, the partners that we need to, both online, offline, uh, TV shopping, hospitality, and, and, and all the channels. We've launched predominantly online in 2023 uh, with some key retailers there, Home Shopping Network, QVC, uh, Wayfair, Walmart, Amazon, Williams, Sonoma. These are uh, household uh, retailers in, in America and they have supported us for online launches to see how we go. Um, but the, comp the good thing is that we're now in really strong discussions about 2024 in-store launches with many of those key retailers. So hopefully when we speak in March, we'll have a lot uh, of good news for you to tell you about our expansion plans in, in the USA. Um, and finally, uh, as I mentioned on, on the earlier slide, uh, the first half has seen uh, some strong growth of more than 120% in, uh, in North America, obviously from a, slow, a lower base, but that still, again, gives us a good uh, base to grow uh, and continue to reach out those goals in 2024 and beyond. And if I can just move to the next slide, thank you, Hannah. Um, new product uh, development on consumer goods. I won't go into too much detail on the 2020-22 highlights. You've all seen uh, a, a lot of these uh, products and we've spoken a lot about before, but you can see they're the perfect pour, the Aurora products, uh, smart vacuum canisters, and these are all giving us the, the, the potential to grow in the, in the existing markets and new markets that we have. 2023, we have lots of new launches. Uh, we're launching the Evolve Plus Advanced Filter. This is a filter that... Uh, targets lime scale. So again, give something new uh, to the consumer and really target in those areas such as the UK and, and London in particular, south, uh, south of the UK in particular, where lime scale is a problem. 
Uh, we expand in our perfect pour range with the perfect pour dispenser, which is a very strong uh, product in for markets such as the USA. And we've also uh, completed the uh, the in in sourcing of all of our uh, filters with an antibac filter now produced in our um, Vicenza factory in China, which is predominantly for the APAC market, but not only is also a perfect product for the baby care type products that, that we service in the market. Um, also at the same time, uh, not only the Evolve Plus is targeting Limescale, but we also have a Leica version to target Limescale. So depending on the markets and where the brands are stronger, we, we have that, that covered as well as uh, developing a filter that is specifically tuned to to be uh, to get, deliver better results for tea and coffee uh, drinking uh, uh, tea and coffee drinking. Um, if I move to the appliances, um, you would have seen some videos playing in, in the bottom there. The Aurora Coffee is our hero launch this year. Um, we are about to launch that in North America in October and later in the year in UK and Europe. Uh, this is an extension of our uh, Aqua Optima uh, Aurora range and really starts to give us that full coverage of hot water, uh, chilled water, coffee um, into, the, uh, into the market. And again, a very key product for the North American market, which is the largest market for filter coffee. <clears throat> you will also see in the, the bottom half of that uh, appliance section that we're launching the, uh, the water filter kettle under the Leica brand in North America under the Aquaptima brand, but in, in Europe and the UK under the Leica brand. And that goes together with a breakfast set. Why, you may ask, uh, do we have a breakfast set and sell toasters as well as kettles? It's because uh, in the UK in particular, but not only in most European markets, around 40% of all purchases of kettles are also purchased with a matching toaster. So again, it gives us that expanded uh, revenue opportunity. And in the bottom there, you can see we've also launched an air treatment products and our first uh, sparkling water maker, which is, is launching as we speak this week in, in the UK. For the future, um, I, I can't go into too much this with future because we're still working on uh, securing the IPs and finalizing the technology, but we will have a next generation Evolve filter and the next generation Biflux filter. And we will look to expand on our success with Perfect Pour by bringing a new range of premium jugs. That's not what they'll look like. That's just a placeholder. Um, but obviously, as we get closer to launch, we'll start to share some of those details on what our premium filter jug will look like. On the appliances side, we will continue to expand the Aurora range. Um, you can imagine that what's next after coffee, we will add sparkling. So we will have a range of products that also add sparkling to them. Um, we will look to bring a handheld vacuum sealers to go uh, together with our more desktop range. Uh, and that gives us stronger price points that are really uh, key for uh, supermarket and grocery channels. And then at the bottom there, uh, again, not representative of the actual product, but you'll see we will look to bring a premium beverage station range. So under the Leica brand as a step up to the Aurora range under the Aquaptima brand. So again, really looking to expand our product portfolio across all the categories. And I think uh, now I'm passing back to Mark. Thank you very much, Harry. So, a little bit conscious of time to make sure we, um, we give you questions as we go through here. But obviously, for us to be able to achieve the objectives that we've set out here, you know, the people in the organisation are absolutely key. Uh, a lot of focus on the people internally, really making sure we've got the right bench strength of people and that we're growing our people internally. What we're really trying to do is to provide challenge and a career growth for those individuals so they can realise their full potential as well as us realising the full potential of, of the company itself. A lot of things going on inside the business at the moment. We are we are strengthening parts of the business. We've hired a new managing director for the SCB division. Um, they will start um, early in October. Um, but also bringing in that new business structure has allowed us to actually really try and find the right people within the organisation to focus on the right parts of the business and, and allowed some opportunity for people to actually progress within their careers, which is clearly very important. We've put in our own in-house um, recruitment so that we can actually manage the costs uh, much more carefully. KPI for us at the moment is less than a £5,000 per, per post, which is actually a significant improvement on, on a historic recruitment levels through agencies. And you know, onboarding for us is extremely important, particularly in China. Now, the, the actual speed at which we produce controls now, we produce a control every 1.8 seconds. So the, uh, the operators have to keep up with the robots, which is actually quite challenging at times. 
Um, so we need to make sure that they're being trained very, very effectively and very quickly when they come on board so that we can maintain those people through the longer term. Today, voluntary turnover of the business um, in 2022 was actually less than 4%, including those, those operating in China. So that is really a, a very, very strong position. Average tenure of the business is around six years at the moment. Um, if I look at certain areas, particularly staff levels in China, it's over 10 years. Uh, and I think it's very hard to find a company that has got that sort of level of tenure in China. And over on the Isle of Man, uh, it's around uh, 11 to 12 years. So again, you're managing to make sure we can keep that core um, resource within the business. From a training development point of view, obviously still very important. We've implemented a number of different initiatives, particularly e-learning, and that's given us an 18% increase in training without any increase in, in, in spend. But it also means we can actually put in training packages that are mandatory for certain parts of the business. So on certain things like approvals and, and um, um, obviously corruptions, all those types of things, we can make sure that all of our employees go through that training process and actually have to pass that training process as part of their induction when they come into the organisation. If I can move to the next slide then, please, Hannah. Um, engagement and retention are yeah, clearly very important for us. We want to make sure that we are providing a challenging environment that really supports engagement and retention for our people, constantly looking at ways to improve employee benefits you know, and the environment in which they work. Obviously, we've got the new factory, which is obviously very positive. Um, you know, the dormitories are, are more like a, a mini hotel there at the moment, which has been very, very well received by our staff. Um, when we moved from our old factory to our new factory, we managed to keep over 80% of the operators in the business, um, which is a very, very high percentage, um, given we were moving something like 22 kilometres away between the two parts. And in our staff, it was literally 100% of the people that moved across. So very, very positive. We've done a lot of work in hybrid working. We've done a lot of work in trying to actually standardise the hours across the business, which has effectively given them a 5% pay increase. And we've looked very carefully at the hardship allowances for those people on slightly lower salaries to make sure they're not, not you know, adversely impacted by the cost of living crisis. So a lot of work's been done internally, as well as providing you know, um, incentives to go out and support local charities. Um, you know, obviously, that's going to help us from a social part of the uh, ESG, as well as helping the individuals and helping our communities in which we work as well. So all of those have been very, very positive additions and changes within our employment. And finally, um, moving on to ESG, um, again, this is an area where we have been very strong historically. We've got some great products. We're saving energy. We're removing single-use plastics. We're taking out viruses and bacteria from water. So from a product point of view, you know, very, very positive. Uh, we are actually operating um, as net zero scope one and two in 2023, with the exception of Billy. Uh, that will be bought in line in 2024. Um, we use ISO very strongly in the business and we're pushing that out to all of our um, um, operations, including Billy, as we move forward. Um, and now recently adding ISO 50001, which is the any energy management um, ISO measurement as well. So that always has been a very strong focus for us. From a social point of view, you know, we are really trying to improve the environment. As I mentioned, we are recognising the values that we want to encourage in the organisation with particular awards around things like passion, uh, which is you know, trying to do things that are um, positive to the environment, um, as well as introducing things like volunteering days um, across, the, across the different sites we have in the organisation. Obviously, governance is also very important. You know, we have um, board level uh, reviews. Uh, any, our, one of our NEDs, Richard Sells, provides oversight um, for the ESG. It's something that is on every um, PLC board that we have uh, in the organisation. And it really now is part of our culture inside the organisation whether it's the day-to-day -day running the business or whether it's new product development, you know, we always put um, sustainability as a key part of, of that development. So if I can move to the next slide, please. So looking at the, um, the scope one and two, as I say, very good position. We actually only now have less than 3% offsets for scope two. So that actually exceeded our targets of, of 5%. Um, the next challenge for us really is to move into scope three. And one of the, uh, the issues we have with that is 94% is of our scope three emission, emissions are what we would call in use. So that is when a consumer buys a kettle and they start to boil water in their home. So really we've got to start working on our new product developments and try and change behaviors of consumers such that we can actually reduce that scope three, which is obviously gonna be very challenging. So we can only really impact 6% of the overall scope three, something that we are very focused on and working with our top 10 suppliers to be able to achieve that. And again, Hannah, if I can skip through to the next slide. This just shows you some of the areas, particularly in the product side. So 
the Aurora, Harry mentioned that already, that only ever boils the amount of water you actually need. In the UK alone, we waste over 300 million pounds a year boiling water that we never use. So we either overfill our kettle or we boil it twice. We all, we're all guilty of doing that. So we're trying to change the behavior with products like the Aurora, which will only ever boil what you need. The middle product there is the dual flow. It's a kettle and a one cup combined. So you can choose to boil just one cup of water, leave the rest of the water cold, or you can choose to boil the whole kettle if you want to go out and use it to maybe defrost your windscreen, which some people still do and appreciate shouldn't do. So it does give you that option as well. And then finally on the bottom there, um, you probably don't realize that on average, um, a human being every year will swallow 12 credit cards. Um, in fact, the range is anywhere from 12 to 50 credit credit cards, depending on where you're located around the world. And um, this is a very simple device that goes on the end of your tap, providing a filter that will take out microplastics, sand, rust, and all those horrible things that you have in your everyday drinking water that many of us just, just don't realize that are there. Again, a product that's now available in the marketplace and, and actually we're promoting very strongly um, both in the UK and in Italy. So finally, for me, before we go to the questions, I'm just going to go to the executive summary, if I may. Um, so we've announced the strategic business objectives. Clearly, we are, we are very um, committed to those numbers, looking to go from the 107 million to 206 million by 2026, with a gross profit going from 42 million to 80 million. We believe those are very realistic targets. I think we've been quite prudent in some of those markets, particularly around the market groups themselves, um, given out the underlying conditions at the moment. Um, in terms of, of Billy, you know, we see that as a very, very strong addition to the business and will provide very strong growth. Um, however, it has increased our, increased our net debt, so we are taking precautions to make sure we balance those capital allocation priorities. And to be prudent, you know, the board is prioritised reduction of debt um, with a clear path to get to 1.5 times over the medium term. Um, going forward, you know, we have changed the dividend policy such that we will implement a payout ratio of 30% of adjusted profit after tax, which will enable sustainable returns to be delivered to our shareholders. And obviously, as we get the closer or to that 1.5 times, then we will actually look to release excess capital to our shareholders you know, as appropriate. So this really, in our view, is a plan to really get a path to sustainable growth. So with that, Hannah, I will, I will hand over to you because I am sure you've got a list of questions that have been passed on during the course of the meeting. In your AG, AGM statement in July, you referred to improved trading and green shoots. Um, why has that situation changed so rapidly? In honesty, I don't, I don't think it's changed rapidly in particular. So the green shoots were looking at things like the OEM production lines, which were ramping up and they, they, they were showing very positive signs versus the prior year. Yeah, that has continued, but not at the rate that we would have anticipated in a normal downturn recovery. Typically, in a, in a bullwhip effect, you will get a very fast return being a, a tier four supplier, and you'll get back to that sort of 5% CAGR growth rate very quickly. Because of our, our, our dominance in the regulated market, where we have sort of above 70% share, we're seeing that as a much, much slower recovery. So it's still a recovery, but not quite as fast as we perhaps anticipated in those early days. Uh, given how close you are to breaching your covenants, would it not have been more prudent to totally cancel the dividend? Um, I, I think the fact that we're paying the dividend shows a level of confidence from the board that we have the cash flow to be able to actually cover that dividend. Um, you know, obviously, the, the uh, covenants do change in September from a 2.75 um, leverage down to a 2.25, and it stays at that for the rest of the term of the loan. You know, as we saw from the, the presentation, we're looking to get to 2.1 times by the end of the year and going into next year. Yeah, plenty of headroom in, in, in those covenants as well. So yes, it's, it's, there's a short-term squeeze. Uh, we obviously built the model um, and, and shared those with our uh, banking syndicate. Yeah, they show compliance through the, through the process, but we were in regular contacts with our bank who have been extremely supportive and, and remain supportive yeah, to, to our forecast going forward. Thank you. So to reiterate, the covenant um, does not reduce below 2.25 times. Um, and are you confident on that basis that an equity placing uh, won't be required? We will not be doing an equity placing. I'm very confident of that. Thank you. Um, are there any plans to rationalise the product portfolio of Leica? Yeah, I mean, we, we have been doing that, particularly on the appliance side. So, yeah, there was over 200 different products when we acquired Leica. We've probably got rid of around 50% of those already, particularly in some of the medical device applications where approvals are very expensive and the volumes were very, very small. So we are looking at those 
appliances to really sort of see which are the profitable appliances to go after. And we will continue to do that as we drive inventory out of Leica uh, going forward as well. Um, thank you. Um, big pardon, I just scanned through these. You've traditionally been a business to business, uh, a B2B business. And so the move into uh, D2C is a departure. Um, I assume that the distribution channels are entirely different, meaning that you are unable to leverage your existing networks. Is there not also a risk that you are competing with B2B customers? I mean, actually, they, they, they are quite different. I mean, when you look at the consumer goods side of the business, I mean, Aqua Optima has been in our business now for over 16 years. So that's always been sort of business to retail or business to consumer. So we've always had that in there. When you look at the kettle business, you know, we work with over 450 brands and retailers around the world. So it is a different route to market. I fully accept that, particularly the digital side. But actually, we're also still interfacing with very similar customers that we have done in the past you know, with the, the kettle part of the business. So we don't see this as competing with our customers at all. Um, we're, not, we're not producing kettles. We're not looking to produce kettles in the future either. However, where we've got new technology, we are looking to do things within our own sort of capabilities. And that certainly will expand going forward as well. But... Yeah, I think yeah, we've got a, a very good structure. The fact that we split the business into those two divisions really is making sure that we focus you know, on the correct route to markets for those, those two divisions. And I think that's yeah, quite a significant change in the business, which will allow us just to be much more focused on each of those two divisions. Um, thank you. Uh, capitalized development spend jumped significantly to 4.1 million in the period. Why was it so high? And what level do you expect it to be in future periods? I mean, a, a part of that is through the, the acquisitions. I mean, I'll, I'll let Roger jump in if, if, if um, she wants to add further to this. So, yeah, we've obviously made some acquisitions. You've had, you've had Leica come in there, and now we've got um, Billy in there as well. So we are increasing that. Yeah, that probably is, is going to be relatively constant in the longer term at that type of level. Yeah, obviously, yeah, we are a technology-led company. We want to invest in technology. You saw today on the slide some of the things that we're trying to do that really will change the benchmark, particularly in that kettle control, as an example. So... That is something that is very important to our future, something that will allow us to protect our margins as well. So something we will continue to do going forward. Brilliant, you're rattling through these, great. great. Um, <laughs> considering the higher cost of debt and um, li likely higher for longer rates in the market, does 1.5 times net debt EBITDA target still make sense? Or should you be thinking of lowering that target further to one times? Um, I mean, I, I go back a little bit in history. So when I when I joined the company um, 17 years ago now, gosh, that's a long time, um, the debt was seven and a half times EBITDA. Um, the, the, the kettle business in normal times is extremely cash generative. Billy gives you cash returns of over 88%. Um, so we are able under normal times, and suddenly as that debt comes down, to, to generate a significant amount of cash. So as a board, yeah, we are very comfortable at a 1.5 times EBITDA, uh, and we would see that as a sensible level. Actually, when you get to the end or the mid third quarter in 2025, we paid off one of those those um, funds, uh, and actually, you'll find that the, the, the debt ratio then drops very, very quickly from that point onwards. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, um, and obviously, right now you feel your debt levels are too high. Um, obviously, your dividend policy over the last few years has been um, particularly strong. Uh, do you now regret your um, rigid dividend policy, which has seen cash flowing out the door, which could have been used to um, make these growth acquisitions um, less expensively? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, obviously, a, lot, a lot's changed in, in, the, in the sort of macroeconomics over that period of time. So yeah, when we listed, we had a 7 or 8% yield, and yeah, we were very comfortable with that. We had two, two times cash cover for that, for that dividend at that point in time. Over a, a five-year period, you know, we've made three acquisitions. We've got a new factory over in China. So we have actually invested quite heavily in the business. Um, yeah, we are now at a point, I think, that we've got some very, very strong acquisitions in the business with a significant amount of opportunity to be able to grow those businesses. Um, it could, we, could we have changed that dividend policy earlier? You can always argue it's very different with hindsight. You Probably about 50 to 60% of our fund is income funds. So what we're trying to do as a board is to balance the requirements of both those and, and the growth of the business going forward. Um, yeah, I think what we've done with the, with the policy today is, is the right thing to do. We're trying still to be able to give um, a dividend to those income holders, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that we can deliver a little bit quicker. 
um, so we can get back on the path of having that that um, additional cash, if you like, to to share in different ways or invest further in the business for growth. Okay. Um, the slides showed a dividend restriction on leverage ratios above two and a half times. Given the 0.9 pence dividend declared, does this mean leverage ratios have already reduced below this level? Uh, we're below the two and a half times, yes. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of headroom now on the two and a half times going forward. Good. Um, and um, what are the risks? Or I, I think you've sort of covered this, but we have a number of questions. So I think it's worth reiterating. Um, you're obviously comfortable that you won't breach your banking covenants at the, UN, at the year end above two and a half, uh, 2.25 times. But if you do, um, what can you do to mitigate this? I mean, obviously, we're, we're managing our cash flows very carefully. We're also in constant dialogue with our syndicates who are very, very supportive. Um, you know, if, and we don't believe this is the case, if there was was um, you know, a marginal breach, it would be very marginal. And you know, from the discussions we've had with our syndicates, we're, we're very happy that they would support us. So we don't believe that would cause any issues and it would be a very, very short term if there was. Uh, obviously, the model we've got and the model we present to the banks does not show that. It shows us in compliance for the rest of the year. And obviously, that headroom is growing all the way through as we go through Q4. Thank you. Um, the 26 revenue growth projections are these adjusted for inflation? I think um, we, we are not necessarily looking at the inflation numbers when we do that, but I do think we're being very prudent in things like the market growth. So I think there's plenty of, of headroom to, to cover there. We have not specifically added any numbers for inflation in those forecasts. I think they go and say, should we be adding inflation on it? 5.2% uh, CAGR. Um, if not, it seems like the growth will be largely inflation-led rather than market share growth-led. No, the growth we've got in there are very, very much market share and, and new product development growth-led. It's not, it's not using inflation or anything else to actually adjust those numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, you said second half is always stronger. So why was there a pre-tax profit of 10.6 million? Um, in the second half 22 compared to 11.6 million in the first half 22. Yeah, 20, 22 was was quite um, an abnormal year. I mean, I, I think you, you have to go back to sort of 19, or sorry, to 19, to 2021, really to sort of see sort of the normal um, profile of the business. Um, so it's very hard to, with all, the, with all of the macroeconomics that have gone on around COVID and, and uh, the sort of cost of living crisis and so on, you really sort of need to look at a three-year average to sort of look at that profile. And if we do that, you know, we will still see that the PAT for Q4 is still below uh, the average for the last three years uh, in the marketplace. So, and, that, and that's without, the, the previous years obviously didn't have the benefit of billion there as well. So we're still very confident that that PAT in Q4 is still a very realistic target. Okay, thank you. Um, you've got your um, strategic business objectives revenue of 206 million and gross profit of 80 million by 26. Um, can you give any guidance for the more immediate future? I probably at this point should direct you all to um, the forecast on our website, but is there anything you'd like to add to that, Mark, or Radris? I mean, yeah, I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, there, there are a number of house brokers that have provided the analysts here clearly, and, and yourselves as well, obviously. Uh, clearly, we have we have given input into that guidance, so I think those forecasts are probably the best forecast to take for the short to medium term. I would say that yeah, we are um, being quite prudent though in some of those areas, particularly with respect to things like the rebounds of the kettle controls, just purely based on the fact that we have not seen the typical cycle of return. So um, yeah, well, I'd like to think there is some potential upside there, but we are being prudent in in the forecast that we've got out there. Um. Controversial. Considering the low gross margins from SCB, what would you not consider selling this to Delever? Um, the gross margins of SCB are actually quite high. So I mean, Billy is running at a, a sort of margin of forty-six percent, and, and Catalyst is around thirty-seven percent. Typically, that would be forty percent. So um, yeah, for me, they are they are very very strong performers in in the uh, overall market. If you look at the consumer goods side, the SCG part of the, of the business. Yeah, we're looking at that to be around 30% margin. So still actually positive, but very, very strong growth opportunities. So we see both of those as very strong strategic additions 
um, for the long-term growth of the business. Thank you. Um, what are your plans to, in the um, Indian market? And do you have a specific strategy there? The Indian market, I mean, just talking about kettles for a second, I mean, the Indian market is, is around a 12% penetration. Um, so it's, it's quite low in, in terms of, of overall market. It is one that is actually starting to grow quite well. I talked a little bit about the less regulated market in the, the presentation. You know, we've seen a 30, 33% growth, um, well above the market growth, and India is certainly as, as a key part of that growth. So it is something that we are working with our, our OEMs to invest in. Most of it is done through the China-based OEMs who have their own routes into those markets. Thank you. Um, what is the strong evidence you can share of cost rationalization across the recently acquired companies? Gosh. Um, I mean, there's been, there's been a whole number of different rationalization programs. If we look at things like um, Leica, you know, we've moved production lines, for instance. So we, we've actually put in a new production line, in fact, in, in um, Leica to, to actually reduce costs for the end user and for the transport costs and so on. You know, we have certainly integrated the business such that the um, Leica head office becomes center of excellence for the water division. So we've obviously consolidated a lot of work around that. From a procurement side, yeah, that's all managed through the China side for the water filtration side as well. So again, lots of work on procurement. If I look at Billy, um, already we've made quite a lot of movements in there. We're doing a lot of work downsizing a lot of the um, storage facilities around, around the globe, particularly in Australia and the UK. We've merged the head offices so that in the UK now, we've actually got a head office that, that actually houses both Strix and Billy employees. Clearly, there's still a lot of work to be done in Billy on things like procurement, uh, consolidation of marketing and so on, but something that is, is ongoing in, in priorities. Yeah, we've only had that since the uh, beginning of December last year, so still quite early days. Do you see yourself vulnerable to a hostile takeover from private equity? I mean, you know, we get asked that quite a lot. You know, there, there is you know, clearly where the share price is today. Um, it is it is a very low share price. But I would like to think that what we've done with the capital markets today is really show this business hasn't changed. The structure hasn't changed. Yes, the capital market has taken a little, little bit longer to recover than we would have liked. Uh, it will still go back there. And if you look at our three year plans and you know, our targets of the 206 million with an 80 million target, you know, somebody would have to pay an extremely high premium for us to consider that a viable bid for the business. So right now, yeah, we're not, yeah, it's, it's something obviously we're conscious of and something that as the board we discuss, but yeah, right now I, I don't think um, we are overly concerned because of the premium that would be required to make that an attractive bid. Thank you. Um, a few questions on directors' purchases and whether you have any plans to make any. <laughs> um, so up until uh, yesterday, we were in a closed period, so we weren't able to do that. Um, Speaking for myself, and it's the only person I can really speak from, yes, it's something that I am considering. I will be watching the market very closely over the next few days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what was Billy's sales and operating profit performance in the first half 23 versus first half 22? I don't have that, that figure with me today. I think the easiest thing to, to say is when you look at the year on year comparisons, you know, um, Billy is around 10% up both in profit and in revenues year on year. Um, if you look at the whole group, you know, certain parts were higher, certain lower, but as, as a group, Billy is about 10% up year on year. Thank you. And what was the approximate acquisition multiple of Billy on the 2019 numbers? On the 2019 numbers? Billy was obviously purchased in 2022, and that was a 3.8 times EBITDA. Yeah, thank um, you. I don't, I don't have figures going back further than that to hand. That's fair. Right, let's, let's. I'm conscious of time, so we've, we've still got a few, but I think um, a lot of people would appreciate a little bit on the near term guidance and your, your, the sort of view on current trading, visibility of orders into Q4. So obviously, uh, we've gone through a lot of work in the last you know, couple of weeks, month, you know, to sort of really look at the business and see where it's heading. Um, so we have actually, as, as you know, moved the PAT forecast to be in excess of 21 million. Um, as I say, confident on that when you look at the quarterly PAT numbers going forward. In terms of the, the various parts of the business, you know, we are seeing positive traction in the consumer goods side of the business. 
Um, yeah, certainly versus Q1, we've won a quite a number of good contracts in the first half that will start to actually deliver during the second half of the year. If I look at the kettle side of the business, you know, we are seeing, as I say, positive growth in the market, albeit slower than a, than a bullwhip. Um, and that's all taken us to that that sort of PAT number of the 21 million. And you know, we are confident of delivering that 21 million in the short term. Well, thank you very much for those responses. Apologies if we didn't get to your specific questions. I will share them with management and we will try and respond. Um, that just leaves me to remind everyone if they could please fill out the feedback form at the end of this presentation. And thank you to the three of you. We look forward to an update in six months time. Thank you very much, Anne. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for joining.